If you're looking for a roomy three-row SUV in America, you have a ton of options to choose from. This is one of the most competitive segments in America, and that's why we find so many brand new models and recently refreshed models to choose from. The three new SUVs from General Motors, the grandest Highlander ever, we have the new rear-wheel drive Mazda CX-90, and recently refreshed options from Hyundai, Honda, Kia, Jeep, etc. For Ford, we have the Explorer, and for 2025, it's received a pretty thorough refresh, giving it sharper looks on the outside and much improved tech on the inside. Let's take a look. Because this segment is so large and so competitive, it's just not possible to talk about every competitor that you might cross shop against the Explorer. So if you're down there in the comment section typing, why didn't he mention this SUV or that SUV, that's the reason why. Classically, the Grand Cherokee has been the direct competitor to the Explorer, and that certainly continues for 2025 because, of course, we have the Grand Cherokee L. The Explorer, the Grand Cherokee, and the Mazda CX-90 are really the only rear-wheel drive entries in this segment. So if you're after solid driving dynamics, that rear-wheel drive feel, and of course you want more power, you might want to check out something like the Explorer. Although interestingly, unlike some of the options like the Mazda CX-90, it's not just rear power biased, you can actually get a rear wheel drive Explorer, including the 400 horsepower ST trim. Now, design wise, it certainly looks like a Ford Explorer up front, but it also looks sharper, a little bit angrier with this larger grille. Because of aerodynamic realities and the fact that we don't really need that much cooling, most of this grille is actually blocked off. So if you look closely, it's only this midsection that's actually doing the cooling. The rest of this is just for the aesthetic of having that big, bold grille. We have LED headlights here, of course, with LED turn signals and LED accent lights, LED fog lights below, a little bit of extra cooling all the way down there at the bottom of the bumper. The obvious downside to a rear wheel drive design like we find in the Explorer, Durango, Grand Cherokee, and Mazda is that it's not as space efficient as the average front wheel drive design. The distance between the very front of the vehicle and the dashboard tends to be longer in these vehicles than something like a Telluride or a Grand Highlander. However, Ford has really optimized this as much as possible, and I think they've done a better job at that than Mazda or Jeep, especially because those two vehicles were actually designed for really long inline six engines to live under the hood, and this has a more compact V6 in the twin turbo Platinum and the ST trim. Size-wise, I think that Ford has struck the right balance. This is kind of a Goldilocks just right size. It's not as big and unwieldy as some of the larger options can be. This is notably smaller on the outside, of course, than the Traverse or the Grand Highlander, but we still have a reasonable amount of third row and cargo room thanks to the roof line staying pretty horizontal as it goes towards the rear. Changes to the rear end design are a bit more subtle than they are up front. We have full LED taillights back here, including LED turn signals and LED backup lights, but the turn signals are red, as you can see flashing over there on that side. Instead of a complete light pipe from left to right, Ford splits it up with the Explorer logo right there in the middle, and then kind of a hashed treatment to that light pipe as it wraps around to the side. The release for the power hatch is right over here under the R, rather than being centrally located, and the power hatch is standard now in the Explorer. At the bottom, this particular model has quad exhaust tips, and every Explorer is going to get 5,000 pounds of towing capability standard. The Explorer continues to be one of the most powerful options in this segment. You have your choice of 300 horsepower or 400 horsepower from either a 2.3 liter turbo or a 3 liter twin turbo V6. The rear wheel drive nature of this vehicle is the reason they can offer 400 horsepower in this kind of package. Generally speaking, rear wheel drive transmissions are able to handle more power than front wheel drive transmissions, and they don't need to limit the power as much in lower gears as you may find in some of the competition. So even versus some of the front wheel drive or front wheel drive biased all wheel drive options out there, the 300 horsepower Explorer is gonna be notably quicker zero to 60. Fuel efficiency, that is the one downside here. The most efficient Explorer is gonna be the rear wheel drive 2.3 liter turbo. You'll get 24 miles per gallon. That drops down to 23 miles per gallon if you choose all wheel drive. And if you get the three liter six, then it drops all the way down to 21 miles per gallon, whether you choose rear wheel drive or all wheel drive. That is kind of the interesting twist. Unlike the Mazda CX-90, all wheel drive is optional here. It's not standard. So if you want 400 horsepower driving only the rear wheels, this is definitely the way to go. Rather unfortunately for 2025, the hybrid system is gone. So if you want a hybrid, run out and find one of the last remaining 2024 model year options. 
Interestingly, the hybrid lives on in fleet Ford Explorers. So if you're a police department, you can still buy the hybrid, but if you're anybody else, you can't get the hybrid. You just have the two engine choices. Depending on the options you select, the Explorer could have one of the most comfortable seats in this segment. And that's gonna be the one that I'm sitting in right now. We have four-way adjustable lumbar support, but we also have Ford's excellent anti-fatigue massage functionality. It has air bladders in the seat bottom and seat back cushion, and they inflate and deflate to improve circulation. And of course, you know, help your back feel a little bit better on a longer road trip. One of the nice touches with this system is that it doesn't time out for a really, really long time. A lot of massage functions, they only give you about 15 or 20 minutes. This will just keep going and going and going on those longer road trips. We also have a powered tilt telescopic steering column and a three position memory over there on the driver's door. The power passenger seat, that's optional, but it has the same range of motion as the driver's seat in this trim. When comparing legroom figures, it's important to remember that not every car company uses the same measurement standard, and Ford tends to use one that's maybe, shall we say, a little bit more aggressive than others. Still, there's lots of room in here. The front seat's adjusted for me at six feet tall. Sitting behind myself, I have maybe about six inches of legroom left. I could very easily put a large rear-facing convertible seat behind me. If I scoot over to this side of the cabin, the front seat is almost all the way back in its tracks. I have maybe about four inches of legroom left. Decent amount of headroom here in the second row, although this model does have the panoramic moonroof and that is gonna cut down on your headroom figures. If you want the most headroom, especially in the second row, you're gonna to wanna to choose the option without the panoramic moonroof. You may also wanna choose some of those lower end trims if you want seven seats, because this is a six seat Explorer. Two up front, two in the middle, two in the way back. There's no such thing as a three person bench seat in the back. And that does put the Explorer in a slightly different category than some. Some of the larger options like the Acadia, Traverse, Grand Highlander, etc. They have a three person bench in the back, meaning that they're available as a seven or an eight passenger vehicle. And we're always gonna have one less seat in here. Getting into the way back is pretty easy. Obviously, if you choose the captain's chair option, you can just go right here through the middle. If you don't, we have a tilt and slide second row. In this model, it's powered, of course, but it's gonna be manual in the lower end trims. The one downside to this design is that you cannot leave a forward-facing child seat latch anchored into place and still easily tilt and slide into the third row. Also, like a Highlander, there's just not enough room really to get back there into the third row if you have the bench and you try and slide this forward. Certainly something to keep in mind if you have kids in child seats. It'll be a lot easier in something like the Acadia, Traverse, etc., or of course the Grand Cherokee L because they do let you leave a child seat latch anchored into position and still easily access the third row. All right, let's go ahead and try that from the other side. Again, pretty easy to use power tilt and slide mechanism and a decent amount of room to hop back here in the third row, where you may be surprised by the amount of space there is back here. I've slid the second row seat all the way back in its tracks. The seat is in its most upright position here and my knees, you know, honestly, they're touching the seat back, but it could be a lot worse. The reason that we're able to get this much room back here is that the seat bottom cushion is slammed all the way to the ground. So my knees are kind of in my chest compared to something like a Grand Highlander or again, uh, the GMC and Chevy twins, but it's still pretty comfortable. And I could do this for a reasonable amount of time because of how much headroom I have back here. Just check that out. Maybe about two inches of headroom if I'm sitting in a more natural seating position. If I try and put my head back here to the head restraint, then my hair is brushing this uh, portion of the ceiling back here by the hatch hinges. I have air vents in the back, lots of hard plastics as you'd expect, no real armrest to put your arm or anything like that on, but I do have cup holders on each side and USB ports in all three rows. If you're planning on using the Explorer as a family vehicle, you may really appreciate the fact that we get latch anchors in both of the rear seat positions in the third row. That's gonna make it easier for certain booster seats to be installed back here and not have them flop around. And of course we have lots of headroom, so some of those taller kids that still need to sit in a booster seat, they may be just fine back here in the third row. Just keep in mind, their knees are probably gonna be in their chest still. Behind the power hatch, we find a reasonable amount of space, just over 16 cubic feet, but a lot less space than you'll find in a Grand Highlander, Traverse, Acadia, Enclave, etc. And that's simply because the Explorer is a smaller vehicle. 16 cubic feet is enough for some of these 22 inch roller bags to live back here, but you could not fit them in this position and still close the hatch, of course. You could align them like this, but you're only really gonna be able to fit three bags across the back. We do have a power folding third row in this model, and it's a pretty quick power fold mechanism, actually. I'm really surprised about how quickly that comes back up. If I move these bags on top of the third row, then we do find a little bit of additional storage space under the floor. Under the load floor, we do find a reasonable amount of additional space, including some right there under that area. And then going 
further down the rabbit hole, we find a temporary spare tire. So it's not tucked up underneath the bumper. How quickly do the rear seats move? Well, let's see them in real time coming back up. That is surprisingly fast, actually. Headrests, those are still manual. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are on the Platinum trim, so obviously there are going to be things in here you don't find in the base active trim, like this big panoramic moonroof that extends to just about the second row passenger's heads. Travis is sitting back there in the second row. You can see, you know, not as much clearance as if you didn't choose that option. We get the well-integrated sunshades back there in the second row, height-adjustable shoulder belts, and four-way adjustable ratchet-style headrests. The sun visors slide to the side, and both sides have illuminated vanity mirrors. As you might expect, the Platinum trim features leather upholstery, kind of an interesting texture to those perforations there in the shoulder section of the seat. We have that Platinum badging right there below the headrest. These seats are heated, ventilated, and massaging in this trim. Although I will mention that the motor that powers the inflatable bladders in the seat back and seat bottom cushion is not exactly the quietest. You'll really hear it as you're driving down the road. Moving over to the front doors, that pattern continues on the midsection of the door. We have sort of an imitation barnwood kind of texture here going on on the doors and on the dashboard. That's not real wood in this particular model. If you want real wood, there are a few options in this segment that will offer it, however. We have soft touch plastics in the upper section of the door, stitched midsection materials there, and then harder plastics to help improve durability right down there at the bottom of the door. Moving on over to the dashboard, we find the big, big change for 2025, which is a completely new dashboard design. Let's go ahead and zoom out here so you can see more of this dashboard at the same time. Time, it's really dominated by this very large fabric sound bar that runs from one side to the other. For 2025 and 2026, we're going to see even more vehicles on sale with this similar sort of sound bar design. I kind of like the look. It really dresses up the interior to have more materials going on. This is a fabric coated midsection of the dash. We then have a soft touch upper injection molded section. We then have the Explorer badging right there in the middle of everything with kind of a uh, metal effect trim going on there. More of that imitation wood stitched materials there, harder plastics down below as you'd expect. I haven't been able to test it, but I suspect you'd be able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside that glove box. The big, big change, that's of course happening right here in the middle where we find a larger, just over 13 inch touchscreen LCD in the middle of everything. It supports full screen Apple CarPlay and of course Android Auto as well, or you can collapse it and get some of the more system oriented functions stationary on this side, like the home button there, we now have Google Mapping because this is running the latest Google Automotive operating system, like so many new touchscreen infotainment systems in the US. But it's still also supporting that uh, smartphone projection, which is definitely my preference. I really appreciate the fact that Ford is not only going all in on Google's system, including the Google Play Store, but also offering drivers that choice of what exactly you want to use. It's also cool to note that we have things like WebEx there. You can actually do video conferences here. We have the YouTube app. You can play videos. You can download games. You can also download native ways. We'd have to sign in, of course, to the Google Play Store in order to do that. So I'm not going to do that in this video. But if you want to know more about that, we should have a complete video coming up soon on the Google Connected system. A lot of the functionality is very similar to what we find in the latest General Motors products or, of course, the Volvo product line, but with a bit more of a Ford twist. They say they have a faster processor in here so you can actually download a decent number of vector games on the system and you can game using a Bluetooth or a USB connected uh, input device to the system. You can also use a keyboard if you want to web browse something like that with the software. One thing you will definitely notice is that transitions between different software functions is significantly faster than before. So if I click over here for instance to the climate control option that pops up much faster than before. Don't worry, this is not indicating that there are any sort of screen controlled graphics. It's just telling you where the air is coming out there. One weird touch though, is that if we go back to that and then take a look at the rear climate control, it still doesn't actually link to the front climate control because the rear climate control zone is not the same sort of automatic climate control that we find in the front. So this is actually temperature based. And then back there, it's just a temperature knob dial with no actual uh, definite numbers there. Uh, you can see that you can touch the screen very nicely there. We get some animated pop-ups depending on the function we're looking at, but not everything has a pop-up. Moving down from there, we have two big air vents, some touch controls here for certain system functions like auto start, stop, the lane keeping system, the camera button. We have the big 360 degree camera layout there, auto brake hold, all that's right there. Qi wireless charging mat with some extra storage space on the passenger side. Interestingly, it's not a dual wireless charging mat. There's just one over there on the driver's side. 
The charging mat is one of the higher output varieties available in a modern car, and it doesn't seem to have a problem charging through thicker cases, like the thick case on Travis's Android phone. Down here, we have the storage compartment where we find my smartphone, currently USB connected. The system does support wireless Android Auto and CarPlay. We have some USB ports in there as well, and a 12 volt power port. There's a decent amount of shiny black plastic in here, so if you're not a fan of gloss black, you might want to consider something else. We have the rotary knob shifter there, electric parking brake, and the drive mode toggle. There's also some additional storage space in that little rubber mat there, and then you can see back here in this storage compartment, there are also some additional USB charge-only ports. Also standard in every model is this full LCD instrument cluster. You can choose between three different themes, but it's mostly a color-based theme choice, so the look and feel of the display does not change markedly from one mode to the other. It also changes a little bit based on the drive mode, so you can see we have animations there for the different drive modes. We have the sport mode, the eco mode there, your regular driving mode has kind of a cityscape that pops up. All these animations are supported by the new graphics processor and CPU of this connected system. So the two displays are actually being driven by the same central processing unit, and they will work in coordination with one another. Thanks to the Android-based operating system, we now have a moving map display in the instrument cluster, and it supports two-screen smartphone integration. So for instance, if I set a route on my iPhone, the iPhone's actually going to be able to take over this screen and also display its moving map over there as well. Moving out from there, we find the Ford steering wheel, pretty similar to what we had before. It's a four-spoke design with moderately small grips up top. We have the driver attention monitoring system here, of course, because we have Blue Cruise in the Explorer now. Controls for the adaptive cruise control and lane centering system over here on the left side, along with volume up and down. On this side of the steering wheel, we have some buttons that control that multifunction LCD, and then of course, track forward, backward, and a voice command button. Before we get this out on the road, let's talk about the wheels and tires. This Explorer has the biggest wheels and the widest tires available, 275-45R21. You'll find these standard on the ST, optional on the ST line, and optional on the Platinum as well. But every Explorer is going to have relatively wide tires for this segment, especially when compared against something like a regular Highlander or some of those smaller options. 255 with tires and 18 inch wheels are standard on the base model, and then you work your way on up to these 275s. All right, it's time to get the Explorer out on the road, and the first thing we are not going to do is a 0 to 60 test on a muddy gravel road in a rear wheel drive Explorer. Are you sure? Yeah, I think so. Th All right, because it's a great opportunity. There are not that many rear wheel drive SUVs that have yep. 400 horsepower, and, and here we are. I'm thinking, I'm thinking that's not on the list, but uh, I can tell you what we got last time we did 0 to 60 okay. test in Explorer. Uh, ST is the fastest, 5.2 seconds, 0 to 60. Mm -hmm. The 2.3 liter turbo, that's obviously the slowest. It's about six and a half seconds, mm -hmm. zero to 60. Both very good times for this segment. Interesting twist, uh, if you get the Platinum with the three liter turbo, it's gonna be a bit slower than the ST because it doesn't get the same aggressive gear ratio. The final drive ratio is actually a little bit less aggressive in the Platinum. I suppose that, that makes sense for the positioning here. Yeah. Still pretty darn quick though. Yeah, I think that's making the best of, of the cir circumstance, right? We have a powerful engine, but if you want that extra performance, gearing is a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. And no matter which way you put it, that is that is impressive times for a three-row SUV. Definitely solid performance numbers, and it's aided by the fact that the Explorer is not as heavy as some people might mm -hmm. think. This is not Durango or Grand Cherokee-like heavy, the two American competitors there. Uh, those can easily get over 5,000 pounds. This is kind of a lightweight at around 4,300 pounds with the 2.3 liter turbo, yep. right about the same weight as a Honda Pilot with notably more power and considerably better torque. Uh, also, we get the 10-speed automatic transmission, which is kind of a rarity in this segment. You know, Honda has the 10-speed, um, but it's not quite as aggressive as this 10-speed. And it's not a rear-wheel bias. That's true. Yep. And you will certainly notice that out on the paved road that we are approaching here. Obviously, again, not going to do anything crazy because it's still pretty <laughs> wet out here even on the paved road surfaces, but this is gonna allow us to you know, apply a bit more power. If you're looking for something that's just a bit more fun, a whole lot more pep, then you want something like this. Yeah. No torque steer, of course, because no power is happening on the front. Right. So as far as driving dynamics goes, this is really in a league of its own. You know, we have Grand Cherokee. Mm -hmm. You can get a rear wheel drive Grand Cherokee still. Mm -hmm. uh, Durango, it's dying. CX-90, all-wheel drive only. So strong rear power bias, but no actual rear-wheel drive model. Right, and you can get this in all-wheel drive, which is great and awesome, mm -hmm. but I love the fact that you can get it in rear-wheel drive only. And it's gonna give you slightly better fuel economy. According mm -hmm. to the EPA- Just a hair. Just a hair. According to the EPA, this model with all-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive 
Theoretically, same fuel economy numbers apply, but in reality, in the real world, you will still get better fuel economy in this if you choose the true wheel drive model. Mm -hmm. Let's see what this is like from a stop. A little bit of turbo lag there, mm -hmm. right around 15 miles an hour, you get all over 400 pound feet of torque happening and really quick transmission shifts. This is definitely swift zero to 60. And I mean, this is in the same territory as something like an Acura MDX Type S mm -hmm. as far as zero to 60 times go. Pretty good company to be in, actually, I would say. Yeah, and especially at a price point that's going to come in below that. Mm -hmm. Now, like you said, there is a little bit of lag, but it comes on the boil pretty quick and then just keeps pushing from there. So the power is you're mm -hmm. not going to leave you wanting. And passing power, and we're in a passing zone, but there's no one to pass here, yeah. is very good. 45, floor it, lots of power right away. And you yep. can get up to 55, 60 miles an hour in no time at all. So this is the kind of family vehicle where there's a lot of power for passing. Importantly, also a lot of power if you plan on towing 5,000 pounds. I would say if you're planning on putting, you know, family of four in here with some of your stuff, most of your stuff in your trailer, obviously, because mm -hmm. tongue weight's a consideration here. Yep. Um, but if you are planning on towing a 4,000 pound trailer with maybe four slim people inside, mm -hmm. you could probably get away with that as far as the payload and towing limits here. Uh, this is going to perform significantly better at altitude, up slopes, etc., than really any of the competition outside of the expected uh, inline six turbo that we're going to find in the Grand Cherokee L. Yeah, and those are going to be built for different purposes, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have all the power in this, the power to tow more, but obviously it's the payload capacity. And if you know you've got the boat, you've got the art, the, the trailer that you take regularly, the family of five or six, you are going to need something bigger. Anyone else who's not in that category, this would be a good option. Yep. Now let's talk about the handling. Obviously, really well done actually in the Explorer. Something that I've mentioned before, Ford didn't really change much here because they didn't need to, to be honest. This drives more like a BMW X5 than it does a Grand Highlander. Mm -hmm. Pretty logical, it's a unibody rear wheel drive SUV that's just baked into the pie right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But the experience is also, I would say, smoother and more premium than the new premium in this segment, which is the Mazda CX-90. Mm -hmm. And my big complaint with the CX-90 is not the power level, it's not the inline six, because those are both fantastic. It's the transmission, that eight-speed transmission that Mazda developed for that vehicle. Uh, the lack of torque converter just means that it's not smooth. And this doesn't have that same herky-jerky feel. If I slow down to a complete stop, and then we just crawl along here, you notice it's very smooth from zero to one or two miles an hour. It accelerates nicely. Mm -hmm. The gear changes are crisp. They're smooth, easy to modulate the throttle on. In the CX-90, because it doesn't have a torque converter, you get some really harsh transmission engagements here and there. Not as smooth as I would like. And you're gonna notice that more in your city driving than you are out on the highway. But again, it depends on what's your situation. And if you're doing test drives of those vehicles, make sure mm -hmm. you are in the scenario, you drive it regularly exactly. to see if that matters. But this is definitely gonna come across a little bit smoother. If you spend a lot of time in slow and go or stop and go traffic, make sure you experience that. Make sure you're happy with the way the vehicles shift. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say that the eight speed automatic in the Jeep comes across as a little bit better polished than Ford's 10 speed. Sometimes I think that's simply because there's so many gear ratios available in the 10 speed. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, that's again, an asset for passing, towing, towing while passing, et cetera. Fuel all of those things are improved. All yeah. of it gets the benefit. So that's one of those, again, if you, if you have a specific drive feeling you're looking for, you might say, hey, it's not worth the extra benefit mm -hmm. that you get over here versus a Jeep. But again, go ahead and try it out. Now, cabin quietness, I will say this does come a little bit below some of the segment leaders. So if you're looking at the most expensive trims of Grand Cherokee L, mm -hmm. uh, if we're looking at the new Traverse, actually the new Traverse was really very quiet out mm -hmm. on the road. I have to say, I was very impressed with its cabin isolation. Most likely the Buick is actually gonna be pretty quiet. We haven't driven that one yet, but that's coming up, coming soon, up soon. So yeah. stay tuned for that video, everybody. This is definitely one of those situations where you have to decide what features you're interested in. Are you interested in a quiet cabin or do you want something that's a bit more powerful, a bit more fun, or do you want something that's a bit more fuel efficient? Because again, that is one of my complaints here. Fuel efficiency, we haven't been able to run this through our usual test loop, but the last time we had the Explorer at home, the 2.3 liter out indexed its EPA numbers. So maybe mm -hmm. you could get 24 miles per gallon on average in the rear wheel drive model. Three liter model, you know, it's basically gonna be right here around 20 MPG. Yeah. If your fuel economy is a priority, that's the one thing that we are definitely missing here is a strong fuel economy presence. 
but with the ST line and the shortening of everything, or as the simplifying of that lineup, I do think they are definitely leaning harder on the performance end of things. Yeah, they really are. And uh, you know, there are some great fuel economy options in this segment. If you're looking for a better fuel economy, definitely look towards the uh, Sorento hybrid on the small end of things, the Highlander on the mid-size mm -hmm. side of things, and the Grand Highlander on the really big side of things. Because the Grand Highlander will give you, honest to goodness, 30 plus MPG, and actually be a little bit bigger on the inside than this. Let's get down to brass tacks. How much is the Explorer going to cost you? Well, the active trim is where it starts at 41350 That is more expensive than last year, but we get more standard equipment for 2025. Most notably, that Ford digital experience on the inside. The two big LCDs in the dash, those are standard. We also get the heated seats, we get adaptive cruise control, the complete Ford 360 safety setup, etc. All of that is included on the active trim. You can also add imitation leather upholstery, heated steering wheel and a power passenger seat if you want to. All-wheel drive, that's a $2,000 option. So it brings things up to about $43,500 for a base Explorer with all-wheel drive. But again, lots of standard equipment. The ST line gives you even more. So we have the Bang & Olufsen audio system, we have Blue Cruise on that model, and the availability to add even more feature content. That's going to set you back $46,110. Again, all-wheel drive is optional. The Platinum trim like we're driving here, this started at 53,250, but this one has the optional 3 liter twin turbo V6. And that's a pretty pricey option at $4,615. That means that a Platinum with the 3 liter twin turbo 6 is actually going to be more expensive than the Explorer ST. That starts at $57,100. That makes sense of course because the Platinum you could consider it as the dual top end model, I guess. Feature set wise, you can get basically the same content in the ST and Platinum. There are a few things that don't necessarily cross over, but the vast majority of the feature set can actually be the same between the two models, but the Platinum starts with more of it, and you have to add things to the ST trim if you want some of the luxury doodads that you see inside the Platinum. Interestingly, this is not the most expensive entry in this segment by far, including the ST. And that sort of makes sense, because even though the ST has 400 horsepower, it was never trying to quite compete with the Durango SRT. The Durango SRT had 475, or of course the bonkers over 700 horsepower version. This is not quite that crazy. Instead, I think this is actually the way I would want my Explorer. The 3 liter twin turbo 6 is really smooth, 400 horsepower is unquestionably a lot of fun, but it also makes this feel really peppy, especially if you have a trailer connected to the back. If you want to know more about the Explorer and towing, check out some of our other videos. We weren't able to do that here, but I have towed with this exact drivetrain option in the past. And again, this is exactly the way that I would go. However, the 2.3 liter turbo is also really peppy, and it's one of the best performing entries in this segment, including the optional engines we find in most of the competition. The downside for the Explorer continues to be, well actually I shouldn't say continues to be, but is now the lack of a hybrid system. Because previously we had one, apparently not enough people were actually buying that hybrid for it to hang around for 2025. If I had a wish list, my one wish list would be a next generation hybrid system that maybe could achieve 35 to 38 miles per gallon in the Explorer. I think that would be an unbeatable combination in this segment. Nobody else has a rear wheel drive hybrid. We of course have the CX-90 plug-in hybrid from Mazda, but the fuel economy in that model definitely falls below where we find the Toyota hybrids in this segment. And Ford has the hybrid tech to really compete head on with Toyota. They have unfortunately chosen not to with the 2025 Explorer. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. And what would you pick? Would you get this? Would you get the new GMC Acadia? I think the Acadia looks fantastic inside and out. And it is a little bit roomier than this. It has a bigger third row, a much bigger cargo area, but it's not going to be as much fun to drive as the Explorer. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section and stay tuned because hopefully we will have a full video on this just as soon as we can get one back at home. See you later.